If I showed you this image of an airplane, could you tell me what airline it belonged to? With some background in aviation knowledge, you could identify this as a Spanish registered plane. However, this plane in its final days never flew in Spain but rather in the British Isles. On February 10th, 2011, this plane crashed at Cork Airport in Ireland, killing six people. The investigation would later uncover the inner workings of an airline which never owned any planes, hired any pilots, or even possessed an air operating license. Things which you would think would be a necessary prerequisite for an airline to have in order to sell tickets. However, at the airline Manx 2, they sold tickets without ever operating a plane. After the crash of Flight 7100, the airline attempted to absolve themselves of any responsibility, saying that they only sold the tickets, and that the responsibility of the crash was with those who operated the planes. Just what was going on at the airline, and how did their business practices contribute to the accident in Ireland? The crash of Manx 2 Flight 7100 is one which is just as much about the airline as the accident itself which occurred under its name. The airline Manx 2 was founded in 2006 and was based out of the British Crown Dependency of the Isle of Man. The island is small with a population of around 80,000. The local airport here serves less than 1 million passengers every year and in the year preceding the events in this video, the airport only served just over 600,000 passengers. So why would an airline make this their base of operations? There actually has long since been a demand for air travel on and off of the island. A gap in this tiny market has been filled on and off for years after the collapse of the island's own reputable airline, Manx Airlines, which ceased operations in 2002. Since then, multiple airlines have tried to fill this gap with varying degrees of success. Manx too was one of those airlines and managed to find profitability in the Isle of Man travel market. They did this by operating tiny commuter planes which did not require the operator to pay passenger duty charges or need cabin crew. The planes could also be reconfigured for cargo operations where needed. As such, tickets were sold at extremely cheap prices. Based in the Isle of Man as well as Belfast, Manx too operated routes which other airlines would simply find unprofitable. This was a deliberate business practice to stay under the radar of other low-cost carriers. This, however, was only just the beginning. Manx 2 was an example of what is known in the industry as a virtual airline. They did not have an air operating certificate or license and thus could not fly planes themselves. So what they did to get around this was contract several small airlines from all across Europe, sometimes paint their planes in a Manx 2 livery, print some in-flight magazines, open check-in desks and hired some ground staff. So when you booked a ticket with Manx 2, it appeared just like any other airline. However, the planes were not theirs, and neither were the pilots. Virtual airlines often come and go with varying degrees of success. Amazon's own cargo airline is in fact a virtual airline. Even though all of those planes are painted in an Amazon livery, they are not owned by Amazon, but rather a handful of other airlines to give a modern example of such an airline. This is how Manx 2 worked. In this case, Manx 2 contracted their operations with companies such as Budapest Air Services, FLM Aviation, Van Air Europe, and a Spanish airline known as Flightline, which we will come back to later. Passengers buying tickets with Manx 2 would reasonably expect to be flying on a Manx 2 plane with Manx 2 pilots. Instead, they would actually have no idea which airline will be flying them to their destination. They would be unaware of the fact that they are actually flying on a plane from an airline they have likely never heard of before, with inexperienced pilots following that airline's operating procedures. The actual airplanes themselves as part of Manx 2's quote-unquote fleet were the small turboprops the LET-410, Dornier 228 and Fairchild Metroliner, which we will also talk about later. Despite their official status as a virtual airline, Manx 2 still branded themselves as a normal carrier referring to themselves in their first press release in 2006 as an official airline on multiple of occasions. The UK Civil Aviation Authority had been keeping a close eye on Manx 2's website and would in fact intervene if they deemed that the airline had crossed that line. In another press release, 
the virtual airline reportedly boasted about how they fly their planes in bad weather conditions when other airlines would be grounded. For example, in June 2010, air services in and out of the Isle of Man were disrupted because of fog. Whereas other carriers suspended operations out of the interest of safety, Manx 2 and its contractors operated 100% of their flights during that period. This becomes even more questionable as some of these planes did not even have a functioning autopilot or flight director as was the case with the accident aircraft. These instruments can be a critical aid in instrument meteorological conditions and drastically lower the workload of the pilots. The accident of Manx 2 Flight 7100 took place on February 10th, 2011, which flew a route between the cities of Belfast, Northern Ireland and Cork. The plane involved was a Fairchild Metroliner. The plane was first launched in the early 1970s and was designed for small commuter hops in the United States. However, many of these planes made their way to other parts of the world. The plane could be configured for either passenger or cargo services, which made the plane an ideal small utility plane. The manufacturer built over 600 of them, of which many are still in service. The nature of this plane meant that by the time that this Metroliner started flying routes for Manx 2, it already had a long chain of ownership. The investigation uncovered that even though Manx 2 did not own this plane, neither did the operator who lent it to Manx 2. The Spanish registered Fairchild Metroliner registered as Echo Charlie India Tango Papa was flying for Manx 2 in 2011. The flights for Manx 2 with this plane were officially operated by the Spanish operator Flightline. Flightline leased the plane from another Spanish airline called Lineas Arias de Andalusia or Air Lada, which was based in Sevilla. That airline had actually leased the plane themselves from a Spanish bank who was the actual owner of the plane. This aircraft was owned by a bank who leased it to one company who then subleased it to another who then flew the plane for a totally different airline in a completely different country. During the day, this plane flew passenger services for Manx 2. However, during the night, it was flown as a cargo plane for the British Royal Mail. The plane had to be reconfigured on short notice every evening and every morning. A rather shocking revelation was uncovered by the investigation of Flight 7100. It had turned out that pilots at Flightline and by proxy the pilots who flew for Manx 2 would have to take on extra ground duties. These included performing a safety briefing for passengers, a role which most people recognize as being usually done by a flight attendant, to which this role was absent on these smaller planes. Pilots had also been known to load passenger bags into the cargo hold and refitting the cabin after cargo flights with passenger seating. On the morning of February 10th, 2011, Echo Charlie India Tango Papa arrived at Belfast Aldergrove Airport at around 5.10 in the morning. The flight crew that would take the plane for the accident flight needed to ferry the plane over to Belfast City Airport where the accident flight would originate. The previous evening, all documentation pertaining to the flight operation that day was sent out from Malaga in Spain. This included weather information and forecast for Cork which showed a load cloud ceiling and visibility of just a few hundred meters. The flight crew operating the plane that day consisted of two members. Captain Jordi Lopez was from Barcelona, Spain. He had only been a captain on the Fairchild Metroliner for just 25 hours. In total, by the day of the accident, he had accumulated around 1,800 total flying hours. The first officer, on the other hand, was even less experienced than the captain. Andrew Cantle from Sunderland, England, had just 539 total flight hours logged. The pairing of these two pilots was highly questionable as this had violated European air safety regulations which state that any inexperienced member of the crew should always be paired with another who is highly experienced. Neither of the two pilots met the threshold for being that senior member of the crew. In other words, the airline had paired two inexperienced pilots. On the accident flight, First Officer Andrew Cantor was the one at the flight controls. Captain Lopez had also not fully completed his training to operate as captain on this plane. Significant parts of his training was still to be completed but was allowed to fly anyway. Neither pilot was hired by Manx 2. In fact, the pilots were not even employed by Flightline, the company supposedly operating the flight. Instead, the pilots worked for Lineas Arias de Andalusia. Once arriving at Belfast City, the crew obtained weather information for their destination, Cork, as well as Belfast and Dublin airports. The crew will be taking enough fuel for their trip there and back to Belfast plus reserve fuel. 
caulk had been subjected to fog. The city on the south coast of Ireland is prone to a thick fog and low cloud ceiling. This can make landing a plane at the city's airport difficult. To help pilots with approach to the airport and low visibility, the ILS equipment was upgraded to a Category 2 system, meaning that pilots with the correct training can land in visibility of just 300 meters. The crew of the accident flight were only qualified to make Category 1 ILS approaches. This meant that for them to legally make a landing, visibility needs to be greater than 550 meters. As their alternate, the crew had filed for Waterford Airport east of Cork, in case of a diversion. A total of 10 passengers would board Manx 2 Flight 7100. There was however delays in boarding due to the pilots needing to make last minute adjustments to the passenger seating, which was fitted by the last crew earlier that morning. Even though the passengers knew this flight as Manx 2 Flight 7100, to the pilots, they were using a completely different call sign, a Flight Avia 400 Charlie. For the sake of consistency, in this video we will refer to the flight as Manx 2 7100. At 10 past 8 in the morning, Flight 7100 left Belfast City for their trip to Cork. The journey south was uneventful as the plane cruised over Ireland. At 8.48, the crew of Flight 7100 contacted Cork Approach in preparation for landing as normal. The airport at Cork is small. It does have two runways, although the shorter runway is not normally used for regular airport operations. By the time that Flight 7100 had contacted the airport, Runway 35 was in use, and their procedures were in place for low visibility. This would have meant that the crew would have to have flown beyond the airport to turn around and fly in from the south. The crew were also informed that Category 2 ILS approaches were open on Runway 17. Because both pilots were only qualified to make Category 1 approaches, they could not legally land at the airport with the kind of visibility that was present at the time. However, they would make an approach anyway. This would be the first of three attempts at landing here that the crew would make. At 9am, Flight 7100 was handed off to the tower for the first landing attempt. During this, the crew had descended below their safe minimum height of 200 feet, down to around 101 feet above the ground. This was in violation of air safety regulations. The crew made a go around knowing that they could not land or even see the runway. They then decided to try an approach on the reciprocal runway, runway 35. The idea was with the sun being behind them, they may get a better view of the runway. By the time that they were lined up for their final descent, visibility was still below limits. A go around was initiated on the second approach, but not before the plane descended down to an altitude of just 91 feet above the ground at 9.14. At 9.15, once the landing was abandoned for the second time, the crew then requested that they be put into holding for quote, 15 to 20 minutes, in the hope that in that time the weather would improve. For this time period, they were directed north of the airport at the Roval Waypoint where they were put into a hold with an altitude of 3,000 feet. During this holding, the flight crew would ask for weather information for Waterford and Shannon airports. The report that came back was unwelcome for the crew, as both Shannon and Waterford airports had such poor visibility that they were below the limits that they needed. Cork Tower offered up another alternative. The airport which serves County Kerry, located next to the village of Farinfor, was open. The weather there was supposedly better and within the limits for them to land. Although at 9.33, there was a slight improvement in visibility at Cork Airport, and the crew went in to make another approach onto runway 17 from the north. At around three and a half minutes to landing, the captain says something very peculiar. He announces that he will take control of the throttles. The one flying the plane was First Officer Cantle, so he should have been the one operating the throttles as they descended. The poor crew resource management would later be in part blamed for this accident by the investigation. The Metroliner was configured for landing with the landing gear lowered and flaps extended as normal. Visibility despite showing an improvement was still below limits and once again the crew continued their approach beyond the decision altitude of 200 feet. As they were descending to the runway in the final moments of the flight, the plane banked sharply to the left. The pilots then attempted a go-around from this by powering up the engines and initiating a missed approach. This was then followed by a steep bank to the right. The plane banked to the right so sharply that there was a period of time where the plane was banked beyond 90 degrees to the right. The right wingtip struck the runway at the foot of runway 17, to which the nose of the plane then fell, resulting in the aircraft flipping onto its back, where it crashed and skidded off of the runway. The crash of Manx 2 Flight 7100 
killed six of the 12 people on board. The question which was posed by the investigators was just how did the plane manage to flip upside down? Analysis of the engines and the recorded data of engine parameters revealed that before the crew called for a go-around, the left engine appeared to show a torque reading of negative 9%. Analysis of the cockpit voice recorder revealed to investigators that it appeared that this engine entered reverse power, which would explain the first bank to the left. Both of the throttle controls were dropped to a below flight idle setting. As the throttles were now being operated by the captain, the first officer flying would have not expected this action. The investigation was unable to determine whether the captain had intervened in the flight controls or not while he had his hands on the throttles. The large asymmetry of the thrust controls coincided with the plane's rapid banking. The investigation found three factors which contributed to the loss of control, to quote the final report. Uncoordinated operation of the power levers and flight controls, which were being operated by different flight crew members. The operation of power levers to below fly idle, an action prohibited in flight, and the subsequent application of power were likely to have induced an uncontrollable roll rate due to asymmetric thrust and drag. And a torque split between the engines, caused by a defective sensor which monitors the operation of the propellers, becoming significant when the power levers were reduced to below fly idle, and the left engine entered a negative torque regime. Subsequently, the power levers were rapidly advanced during the attempted go-around. This probably further contributed to the roll behavior of the aircraft. It was found out that maintenance of the aircraft and the logging of aircraft equipment was not done correctly, and in some cases just not done at all. In the aftermath, Manx 2 terminated its contract with Flightline. Manx 2 failed to oversee its contractors appropriately. Had they have done so, they would have picked up on the lack of maintenance with the plane involved, and the pairing of two inexperienced pilots, one of which was not fully qualified to fly as captain. Manx 2 had also failed to contact surviving passengers and relatives of those who had died under their name. The crash highlighted shocking business practices which were going unnoticed in European aviation, Flightline was already under investigation and had been threatened with the termination of its air operating license by Spanish authorities. Manx 2 was able to keep flying in the end. Going into 2013, the airline rebranded to Citywing under the same management. The airline operated until 2017, after jumping from contractor to contractor until they could no longer source another airline and thus aircraft to sell tickets on. These days, the Scottish airline Logan Air fills that small demand for travel to and from the Isle of Man. Hello everyone, thank you once again for making it through another video. This one had turned out to be longer than I had originally anticipated, but if you did enjoy it, don't forget to subscribe as there are new videos every Saturday. Just a quick note, I am on the lookout for some new stock footage for next week's video. If you possess any video of runway 24 left at Los Angeles airport and would like to help me out and could give me permission to use said footage, message me and I may be able to include it in the next video. I am always on Twitter and my DMs are open and the link to that is in the description. Anyway, I must thank my patrons once again for their support. If you would like to get your name featured or read out at the end of next week's video and have access to it two days before going out on Saturday, you can join my Patreon from £3 per month, the link to that will be in the pinned comment. So a thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Marie Innes, Pacman7, and new patron, Panic Chicken. Great name. Special thanks to my £10 patrons for their generous support. Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Mike Milton, Side Effect, and Will Tanner. A big thank you to you guys, I greatly appreciate the support. And that is it from me this week. Have a good evening, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.